Good afternoon and welcome to a special workshop meeting of the Oak Harbor City Council. Uh, today is November 13th. It is 1 p.m. I'd like to call that meeting to order. Um, we have uh, a table full of people, so let's go around the table and introduce ourselves for those watching. I am Mayor Bob Severin. Tara Heisman, City Council. Joel Servadia, City Council. Blaine. Uh, Blaine Oborn, City Administrator. Sorry, it's a long circle here. <laughs> uh, Brett Arvidsson from Public Works. Erica Wassinger, City Council. And Beth Mines, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council. Thank you very much. What's that? Oh, yes, we, we do have somebody who has called in. Can you hear us, uh, Councilman Wiesner? Yes, Jim Wiesner, City Councilor here. All right. So, Jim, will be that black box right over there. It's a good luck for you. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome uh, those here in the audience and to those that will be watching. Um, let's get started. We have uh, scheduled, I think, to go to uh, somewhere around 4 o'clock this afternoon. It is, as I mentioned, 1 o'clock now. And our first item of business is uh, uh, under, it's an action item, under Public Works uh, A, Professional Services Agreement, Enviral Issues. Clean Water Facility and Windjammer Park projects. And I'll turn it over to Brett Arvidsson. Good, good afternoon. Uh, this is for a Clean Water Facility and Windjammer Park and Bio Issues, Professional Service Agreement for Bio Issues. They are providing the public involvement services for those projects and have been doing it for the last three and a half years. This is an item that was deferred from our last council meeting last Wednesday uh, to correct some. Uh, inconsistencies in the contract and we've hopefully straightened those out to get it, I'm not going to go through the whole presentation but to go back through it is construct is involves two services on our public involvement side at construction period services support for both wind jammer and the clean water facility uh, uh, that's carried as a separate exhibit which is at 70,000 73,400 it's also uh, Exhibit B, which is our support services for our reuse and biosolids program, which is uh, another 16,000 for a total of 89,400. Uh, we've corrected all the contracts to reflect the 89,400, and our new completion date is August 31st, 2019. Um, other than that, our objectives are to build excitement to the community about our clean water facility in the park, help the community stay up to date with construction and navigate the changes of Windjammer Park, which do change fairly frequently. Uh, they help us create messaging and materials for the city's biosolids, water reuse, and upcoming Navy activities, and provide clear and concise messaging to the Oak Harbor residents. Um, anyway, our recommended action is to authorize the mayor to sign a professional services agreement with Enviro Issues for public involvement services for the new wastewater treatment plant in Wijema Park in the amount of 89400 Questions? I guess before we do that, see if anybody in the audience might have any questions regarding this. Okay, it doesn't look like it, so mm -hmm. we'll bring it back to the table here for any possible questions. No questions, no questions. Yes. Uh, I did Blaine. get some inquiries of how much the chamber agreement was for marketing services for Windjammer. It was uh, the total was forty thousand two hundred and sixty-seven dollars. Okay. It's already been approved by the council. Okay. Okay. Anyone? Any questions? Okay. I have a couple of questions. Okay, <laughs> Councilor Wiesner, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Brett, uh, can you give us an idea of when you expect the first biosolids to possibly be available for for sale? That you know that we're have all the testing done and and not be trucking across state any anymore. Do we have an idea of timeline for that? My initial reaction is about March to April, depending on how things work. But we will be producing the dry material into this year, so. This depends on where DOE's comfort level is on, on the product, but we definitely want to be trying to get rid of it this spring to take, care, take advantage of the dry weather period. So, so under this current contract, we would have time then to be create, creating these documents that, uh, and getting some pre-marketing out, and then it sounds like we have 
basically assist assistance with marketing for for what about a four or five month period as we start that, that up the voucher. Yeah, and it's it's also you know it's a long term program for us, so we have to create the materials and, and create the program that staff can eventually. Uh, take over because you know we're not going to use consultants. We're going to be doing this year in year out for a long time to come. So we want to have this program in place and have this communication and stuff in place. And uh, so to us, it's you know eventually staff will be doing this on, at a staff at a, at a public works level. But until we have the initial program thought out and put together, that's what's happening. So again, they're not doing the program for us forever, but it's helping us get the program kicked off. And thank you. And, and do you have an idea? Uh, I, I'm assuming there's other communities that have been doing biosolids. I know this is nothing new. <clears throat> have we looked into the, the development of material that, 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 that's already been done uh, by, by other communities? I mean, we're not going to be selling anything that's new that's already not being sold elsewhere. No, and that, that's, you know, in the industry it's pretty standard and but it's also got to be driven to your marketplace. So we got to find our local sources and talk to them and, and build up their confidence in material. It's historically this class A material, once people uh, understand what it is and the benefits of it, it's actually uh, becomes very popular. Um, but it does you know, take some uh, getting over the initial reaction. It, it's, you know, it's biosolids rather than it's a good material and it's a beneficial material for the community. Yeah, I, I'd love to see it where we can have people come and get a bag and take it home. And that's the kind of material we're going to be uh, creating. And then one other question involving the $33,000 portion of this uh, contract that's budgeted for the, the promotion of Windjammer Park. What type of program do they have in place to coordinate with the chamber so that, I mean, it seems seems a little odd to me that we're going to have two separate entities here, one sitting down in Seattle, one here locally in Oak Harbor, both promoting the same item. Yeah, the 33000 is, we feel, is augment. The, the, the council is pretty much focused on the grand opening, and we have other needs. Uh, it's not only uh, construction and celebration, but we need to communicate as we move through the next six months what's happening, what's available. Uh, so we see the, 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 cap, the chamber's effort is aimed at a, a single event and we're trying to get people in the park and coordinate people in, during the park during construction and with our changing trails and everything like that, it's always, it's always a challenge and uh, frankly we do get a lot of people paying attention to what we're doing and we have to respond to them and like I say, the more we can communicate that in advance, the better off we are. Okay. I appreciate the answer to those questions. I, I guess I have one comment, and, and I guess it's just because I've, I'm kind of looking at the overall big picture. You know, we've been discussing, you know, our, our general budgets uh, coming into next year, and one of the, the wishes of, of council, and I think many people in Carver were, is to bring on a, a you know, some sort of a, a public relations uh, a person uh, on the city that can, you know, get the information out there in a timely fashion to, to our constituents. and. And one of my concerns is now that we're into a budget, we're, we're, we're talking about, uh, in order to, to create a balanced budget, as close to one as possible, about cutting that position down to a, a half-time or a three-quarter time position, or delaying the hiring of that position into the middle of next year to, to you know, help balance that budget. And, you know, at the same time, now we're, we're talking about spending $89,000 for some you know public information and, 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 and marketing, which you know, you know, I totally 100% agree that public work staff should not be doing, and nor uh, is it a load that should be laid upon you guys. You guys are already overloaded, shorthanded, and so I totally, absolutely get that. But what I'm concerned about is when we go to hire that that, that public person, if, if if we do cut that position down to three quarter time or half time, or even wait until the middle of next year, which is typically, a, I guess, probably, I, I'm just going to say a busier time uh, for, for everybody, that we're not going to find as good of quality talent um, to be able to fill that, that part-time position or, or half-time position. And I, I'm just 
thing he had allowed to myself, that this $89,000 would, would, would go a long ways to filling that position. And I'm just wondering, and, and maybe staff, somebody else in staff, uh, Tricia, maybe could interject here. If we were to hire a, a full-time public relations person, whether or not we could not dedicate a portion of their time, i.e. half of their time, to this CWF project and, and Windjammer project, and thus you know, be assigning the, the, the cost of that position or a portion of that position to this project as we, we wrap it up, and, and whether or not for pretty close to the same money we could not end up possibly filling that full-time position and, and again utilizing them through this portion of the project and then uh, having them transition into you know other other projects as we move forward. Yeah. I'm going to take a crack at this and uh, Patricia you can come up here if you if you uh, yeah okay and then uh, Brett's going to have a comment here too. Um, first of all I, I like your innovativeness in, in talking about that and, and certainly we could do it. One thing I want to make clear on here is the actual event itself isn't in the chamber and it isn't in this budget that's supposed to be part of in-house. We're trying to absorb the actual um, coordination. We're going to learn off of what Enviro Issues did for the uh, November uh, grand opening for the for the clean water facility, but we're trying to do that in-house. There is some, going to be some maintenance of the website once this is done and that's this, that the staff is going to be taking over. Um, and then the other issue here is is yeah, certainly we could take some of that money and put it towards that position, but it's only one time. Uh, we can do it for 2019, uh, but it isn't going to be there in 20 and going forth. And so with that, uh, who wants to go next? Yeah, to I would say that, you know, our uh, discussions with Enviro Issues involved not, we, I, you know, we personally would like to get somebody trained to do this. And actually our discussion with Enviro Issues, if we don't have a position we're set up so we can get to the project. If we brought somebody on board, they're more unwilling to transition that and save us costs because they are working on a T&M basis. So I, I think the perfect world for us would be to bring uh, somebody on our own person. I really think we need it personally. Uh, that's my, my red speaking here. But that person's going to walk into a, an active project probably after the first year, because frankly, we're not going to get somebody hired, and I, my needs are now. Um, but we certainly talked to them about if we can bring our own staff in, they're more than willing to help us get that person up to speed and uh, them to take it over. I mean, it's not, it's not all or nothing. Uh, and that's certainly our, our, our work, our working with them is, you know, and I'd really like if we brought our own person on to tap into their brains a lot, because They've been, they know our community and know how to communicate. So I would hope that if we, do, if we had in that direction, we'd still have the virus use as a resource for that new person. Okay, and I, and I appreciate that, for both of you. Uh, I guess I have one little comment, last comment about, you know, some of my concerns with moving forward with Enviro issues, which is, you know, the, the research I've done represents municipalities mostly, you know, or, or uh, utilities you know, with, you know, environmental type projects. And I'm, I'm just trying to, and I know these, these two are wrapped together, but I'm just trying to wrap my head around what they bring to the table in, in, in marketing this Windjammer Park project that, that a normal public relations, I mean, everything I've kind of seen about these folks seems as though most of the public relations efforts that they put forth over the years have been involving environmental type projects. And I don't know that I'm, have seen anything that they've done that's been a uh, uh, you know project similar to to Windjammer Park. From their resume and from what we've seen, I, I'm I'm very comfortable with them and very different. Like, to me, is you can't really marketing is just one part of the public involvement process, and in some ways public involvement is, is marketing. But to me, it's reaching out to our to our citizens and letting you know what's happening. I think if we just need to let the, get good information out there. I think this stuff will sell itself. But if we don't make the effort, it's not going to happen. 
So. Okay. And then I have one last question. I just want to make sure that I have these numbers right before I you know, make a decision moving forward on this. You had said, Brett, that we're, we're currently reaching out and connecting with approximately 250 citizens who email. Uh, the, that, that's where we're, how we're presently distributing this information because I know, of course, that virus issues contract only cause it, you know, covers the cost of disseminating and creating the information. doesn't cover the cost of printing or distributing of the information. So correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I understand it is right now this information is being distributed via email. You have an email list of roughly 250 people outside of the city um, entity that is, this is being distributed to, as well as the people who are visiting the website see this information in. But I remember right, you told me that, that that number was about 150 a month, is that correct? Yes. The email, the email aspect is just one aspect of our public involvement process. That's actually the least cost. We probably spend an hour or two a week on doing those. Uh, we do other things, mailers, we do signs, uh, we do ads. And so to me, it, it's a broad spectrum of public involvement services that you know we don't depend on the email for our full. We've done quarterly mailers for the last three years. Uh, those, you know, are a fair amount. We put up signs, you know, uh, my, I doubled my sign budgets because we put up signs, we try to contact people. Uh, we use a multi, we try to get out in any direction we can. The emails is our weekly notice. It reaches one person, but actually that's probably the least amount of work right now. Keeping the website up is, is a fair amount of work and we do a lot of hits on that. But any printing, distribution, um, advertising, printing of the signs, all of those features are not included in this contract. Those would be costs above and beyond. Those are right? direct costs. Like a mailer for us, if we do a mailer, it's about $4,000 with the printing and, and postage. And, 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 and do, do we choose the company for that, mailing and contract with that company, or is that something done through? No, I actually, we actually uh, get quotes. Uh, we've been used, the last two times we've been using the same people because they're always cheaper, but we generally go out and get uh, multiple quotes from people on that. So it, we'll, we'll send out, say, hey, we want to do this. And uh, so uh, the sign stuff, we've just been using Whippy signs forever. Um, but yeah, we generally we try to get competitive costing on this stuff. So we're not just going to their favorite person. We're trying, actually trying to get some people local if we can. So the circulation of the information once created by Enviro Solutions falls upon city staff? Uh, no, they handle all that. We just pay the direct cost of the mailers. So they, they do all the coordination on it. It's just that uh, the, the, the mail houses, for example, want their, their expenses up front type thing. So. Okay. Well, that's all I have. Again, I, I, I appreciate uh, uh, answering the questions and putting up with them. Uh, I, I certainly appreciate every time that I, I have a question, you, you've got an answer, and I, I do appreciate that. Brad. Thank you very much. Okay. I move to authorize the Mary's Island Professional Service Agreement with Enviro Issues, Inc. for public all the services related to the new wastewater treatment plant and one general park with exhibits A and B totaling to the amount of $89,400. Second. So we've got a motion in two seconds <laughs> to uh, uh, authorize the mayor and et cetera, just exactly like it reads in your packet. Uh, motion by Councillor Cervadia, second I'm going to give to Councillor Heisen. Um, any other input or questions? Okay. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay. So that passes four to one. And uh, thank you, Mr. Arvidsson. We will move on to our non-action items. And that starts with the department budget presentations. I see our finance director joining us, Patricia Soule. Welcome, Patricia. 
Thank you, Mayor. And I think you have an orderly plan for the rest of the afternoon. Yes. I'm just up here to introduce the four, there's four departments that are going to be presenting um, their departments that have changes or things that they would like council to know about. Um, that first one will be the senior center, then development services, then the marina, and then fire. And they all will come up and present and you get to listen to them instead of me. Good introduction. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I don't like to turn down any opportunity to get in front of you and, and present and talk about all the great things that's happening at the Senior Center, so I appreciate this opportunity. Um, also, a quick thanks to Joel for saving our bacon with our phones <laughs> yesterday. He came personally to the Center and spent a couple hours getting us from not receiving any calls at the front desk, having 70 plus missed calls, and 24 or more voicemails gone to who knows where. He found them all, pulled them in. We were able to get back to business. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. So as many of you know what our mission is, we are here in order to empower the older adult, adults in our community for independence, healthy aging, social connection, lifelong learning. In an email that I did send to you, I ha shared these statistics. We send out our annual membership survey. Um, it came back this year with 210 people who took the survey, and over 93% of the people who took the survey indicated that they were satisfied or extremely satisfied that we are meeting the mission of the center. Last year, we were happy with our 87% satisfaction rate, but we were happy to see that it's gone up substantially. So we're continuing to trend in that direction of meeting the needs of programs and services of older adults in our community. A membership update, we currently have 865 members, which is 192 more members at this time last year. So it's really great to see this growth in membership. Um, as you know, also, we have a higher population than the state average here on island. So to me, that just says there's going to be, and this is supposed to be trending and growing, which to me says, wow, new potentials for members daily. So we're just trying to get ourselves in the best um, position in order to be able to serve the, this growing population of seniors. So for our average daily attendance, this is just kind of also a neat little snapshot that shows. Um, this is just the members who remember to check in on our system. So this isn't capturing anyone who forgets to check in for a program. It's also not capturing the community members who are coming for passport services or information and resources or for the communi communal lunches. Um, so there's a lot of people that come in and out of the door that don't check in, um, but this is our members coming for specific programs at the center, which is also very neat to see uh, that we average 71 people per day, members coming for different programs, and that, again, that's on the rise. And of course, our amazing volunteers. When we talk about all we do over there with the budget that we have, there's no way we would be able to do it for the, um, for the cost that we do without um, our volunteers and it's amazing to see the amount of savings that we have because we are able to um, use those amazing volunteers. So I wanted to kind of give you an idea of um, the community support that d and funds that isn't necessarily shown in the budget that you see because of a lot of it is in-kind donations from different community members. So this is highlighting a couple of projects this budget season that we've done without having to use any of our city budget, um, but receiving these in-kind don donations. So we updated the center. The exterior you'll see on the top left is what it used to look like and now we have a patio and patio furniture and it's all landscaped and it was so lovely to have that this summer members people sitting out there again for events it's a great additional space when we have a concert going on and the door is open and it's nice outside and we've got lights hanging it's just been wonderful but again all of this was done with in-kind donations from these group of people that are named here it was just truly truly amazing um, also, we have been able to paint the interior of the senior center. Oop, pushing, there we go. <laughs> and so this shows you kind of the difference before and after of some of the painting we've done. Again, here 
We are trying to get the center in a state which will invite people to come in and hold events, which is going to generate revenue for us. So that all starts with making these changes. We um, also have funds through the foundation to the Oak Harbor Senior Center Foundation to update and replace those chairs that you see. Um, thus, we'll be doing away with all of the, the floating cushions, which will be really nice, but that'll make a big difference as well. <clears throat> Another opportunity that I see um, that we can develop opportunities for re rev increased revenue is through our community partnerships. These past couple of years, we've been kind of growing that as a revenue stream, and there's still more opportunity there, but these are some of, the, of our community partners that we've worked with this year, many of which have financially benefited um, the center. So just a quick recap of um, revenue for this 2017 and 2018. Today, as you'll see, here that we are increasing so the dark green in the middle is the oak harbor senior center generated revenue so anything coming from our programs and membership and rentals events that's all that revenue right there so it's not counting in the donations which is the lighter green on the left and then the general fund is the the yellow on the on the right side um, but as you'll see we are increasing in our revenue which is really great and that's the trend we would like to see we are working to become more financially stable um, and self-supporting over at the center so what i would like for you to consider and think about is patricia had given multiple options and in option four for the senior center it included um, keeping eighty thousand dollars in reserve and then using the, an additional approximately sixty five thousand that's in reserve towards um, our needs for our budget at the center and i think that this is an option that would benefit the center and help reduce the amount we're asking from general fund, um, but also meet the needs of the things that we have requested in our budget. Um, so the 88,000, as you'll notice in 2018, that's the to date for our revenue. So this is, we have a couple months to go yet, but you'll see that our donation was quite higher this year. And that includes an estate endowment that we received from an individual. And that was about $88,000. And so the thought there would be to reserve as much of that as possible for a needed roof replacement. So our roof replacement has been put off several years and we continue to patch leaks. And it's in the best interest of the center to get that roof done, replaced in the 2021-2022 budget cycle. So if we can have those reserves and earmark as much as possible for the roof, that would be um, best for the center. So even though I, you know, I wanted to point out that it looks like there's a trend in increased revenue coming from the general fund. I wanted to know that if you look at the total coming from the general fund for 2017-2018 versus for the 2019 and 2020 budget, it is almost $40,000 less that we're asking for. And that's the trend we would like to see at the center. We are grateful to have the support from the general fund, but we also acknowledge that there is not a lot to go around to all of the, the people who need it. So we are doing our best to increase our revenue um, and hopefully being able to be a little more self-sustaining there. And so these are the capital requests in our budget. Um, the sign is already included in that option, in the funding for the option four. Uh, the sign we're hoping will help us to increase revenue through making people aware, first of all, where we're located. That's always, you know, people always have a little question of where we are. So we want them to know who we are and what that building is right there. But also, because we are hosting more events, um, being, this is a great opportunity for us to, to get our events out there as people are driving um, past us on the street. And then again, the roof request, which, which initially was shown in 2024, but we are asking to move it to 2021 and 2022. So that is my short and sweet report for you. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Is the electronic sign on uh, Woodby Avenue or is it on the... Yeah, we'd be looking at putting it on the corner of Woodby and Jerome. So it would oh, be okay. facing the Woodby traffic, which is higher, definitely more high traffic street. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, Councillor Heitzel. So other than the roof needing mm -hmm. um, to be replaced, it sounds like you're just wanting to keep things at the status quo, you're not going to add any staff members or do anything at major? Right, as far as kind of major expenses, sure. the roof is definitely would, would be the only foreseeable expense. Um, we did include in this budget a slight increase to our program coordinator's position, taking it from a 0.875 to a full-time position, which I think the total cost of that was approximately 6000 But in seeing the, the revenue she's been generating from her added events, I feel really good about giving her a couple extra hours to take her to 40 per week, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Seeing them. Thank well, you thank you, Liz. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Liz, sorry, would you mind emailing me a copy of the copy? Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm happy to. All right, I'll just email it to okay. everybody. Thanks. Thank so, next to join us is our Development Services Director, Steve Powers. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. more than I need there, I think, but. <clears throat> All right. So this afternoon I'm uh, going to do what I think is maybe kind of a rare budget presentation. I'm going to have a budget presentation without any numbers. Uh, we're just going to talk uh, about uh, what we do and some conversation along the lines of some position requests. But uh, what I want to do this afternoon is, is to go over quickly some of the key points associated with Development Services Department. Uh, you can see on that first slide there the things that I, tried, I want to try to hit for you uh, this afternoon. Mission, some of our key responsibilities, uh, challenges, goals, uh, and then our budget requests. Uh, and for most of these slides, I've really boiled down the language out of the budget document itself. Uh, as you might expect, there's a lot more words around, packed around these, these simple thoughts. Uh, but for today's uh, presentation, I think these should suffice. So our mission in development services is pretty simple. We try to help the community establish and pursue its vision for Oak Harbor. Uh, and we do that through three sort of main subject areas, if you will, um, comprehensive planning, uh, our development standards uh, and then how we apply those development standards to a project review. Now, obviously, there's a lot more that goes into each of those statements than what we would talk about this afternoon, uh, but I think the council is pretty well, well aware of the things that go into that comprehensive plan. Uh, it's obviously an all-encompassing vision blueprint, if you will, for the community for a 20-year horizon, uh, and it's really what gives us our bases uh, for everything else that comes after that. Uh, when we're looking at new projects which are being proposed or we're pursuing a grant uh, application for one of the city's own projects, we often find the genesis or the catalyst for that in our comprehensive plan. Uh, and then our development rules have to be consistent with that and help implement it, and then we apply all of those uh, on a project-by-project -project basis. So everything from the broadest of community uh, perspectives down to how will that thing be on this particular piece of property uh, is really the mission of our department. Um, this is the organizational chart for uh, the department as we exist today. The marina, of course, uh, is something that's related to, um, it's certainly my role, uh, but they're, as you know, they are their own separate budget, so you hear from Chris uh, later on this afternoon about his particular budget needs. On the planning side, we have two senior planners and an associate planner. Uh, administra uh, in administration, we have a permit coordinator and an uh, administrative assistant. Uh, building has the building official and the plans examiner. Uh, and so uh, downstairs, our staffing is at eight FTEs. What are some of our key responsibilities? Uh, <clears throat> you can see those on the screen. Uh, I've, I've sort of highlighted those first words for you so you can get a sense of the, the main areas of our responsibility. Uh, and the things that we tackle on behalf of the city, things like the Growth Management Act uh, to uh, 
public health and safety and welfare inspections for building permits uh, down to staffing a variety of committees, uh, including the new uh, Historic Preservation Committee, which has had its inaugural meeting earlier this, no, last month, October, uh, and we'll have its next one in December. So uh, we've got a lot of interesting committee work uh, that we have in the department. So as I went to put together this presentation, of course, uh, being a planner, I went back and found the last one I did and pulled that up and thought to myself, how can I reuse it? And lo and behold, this slide could be practically identical to the one that I showed you two years ago. Um, I don't know if that means that our challenges are consistent or if they're uh, depressingly so, I'm not sure. Uh, but these are the challenges that we have uh, this budget cycle, just as we did the last one. Uh, I think it's always a challenge for us to meet our, our long range planning obligations as well as our short range obligations with dwindling resources. Uh, you've heard staff talk on more than one occasion about the ever increasing complexity of rules that come from someplace else. Uh, and that certainly is true now more so than ever. Uh, we spend a lot of time, just in fact, at your last council meeting, talking to you about the phase two permit. You heard from Kathy some of the new things um, that will be required as part of that. And she consistently says that that will fall to Mr. Powers' de Department of Development Services. Uh, and she's, she's right, that, that comprehensive stormwater planning piece is gonna be a big hit uh, as we start to work on that. Uh, and then I think our last challenge really is to, is to continue to strive to meet our public and our customer needs in a, in a complicated environment. And, and I think that we are seeing a change in those expectations on the customer side. Uh, I, I think they are asking more of their, of their local government. They're asking more of their development services department and their permitting. Uh, and we're doing our best to meet those expectations, but sometimes those are challenges. Uh, our goals uh, for the next budget cycle, 2019-2020, they look an awful lot like our challenges and our responsibilities, uh, but they're pretty straightforward. Uh, we have to continue to keep the city in compliance with the Growth Management Act. Uh, we need to continue working on implementing our capital improvement plan. Uh, obviously, we have to do our best to be timely and accurate when we're talking about permit reviews and applications. Uh, we never can shirk our responsibility to the public health, safety, and welfare. Uh, and then also uh, do our part in advancing the city's economic development goals. And so as I put together that slide for you, I was struck by the phrase that I put at the bottom of the slide, which is these are simple things to say, but, but it's complicated work. Uh, and so I don't want the brevity of the slide to do the work disservice. So what is this, base, this budget based on? Uh, well, you've heard me say this before, we're a people department. Uh, we don't spend lots of money on capital projects or on uh, cap large capital items. We're, we're a people department, so we assist others achieve their goals, whether it's the community or whether it's one of our sister departments. That's really what our function is. Uh, and so the budget is based on uh, some minor increases in operations. And my general rule of thumb is to bump things up 3% uh, and see what that number looks like, and then we sort of trim from there. We continue to have our hearing examiner contract, and I'm just singling that out for you because that's our one professional services item of, of any note, uh, and that's a, a contract that uh, we have on an annual basis. Or actually, it's an annual contract with the hearing examiner, and you recently approved a, an amendment in extending that contract. And so the real meat of this budget is then in the three positions that we requested. We requested a building inspector, uh, a code enforcement officer part-time, uh, and a development review engineer. So I'll spend just a couple of minutes on, on each of those for you. So before I do that, here is the um, organizational chart now with the new positions being requested. So if I look over here on the screen by the window, we've got the development review engineer uh, sort of lining up here on, near the planning division because those are all professional level positions. Uh, we're showing the code enforcement part-time here under building uh, and then the building inspector, and then uh, Chris will talk about his budget, uh, his personnel request when he talks about his budget. So, um, 
The building division has historically been a three-person division. We've had a building official, a plans examiner, and a building inspector. That fell by the wayside, uh, feels like 2011, maybe 2012, is around the time of, of really feeling the crunch of the recession. Uh, luckily for us, we were able to transfer that individual to another place within the city, so he stayed employed. Uh, but since that time, we've been operating uh, with two staff members, the building official and the plans examiner. We've seen um, an increase, uh, certainly in our permit activity, the complexity of the projects that they're working on. And we're also seeing quite a bit of an increase in the code enforcement side of things. And again, this comes back to expectations of the community. I think that they are actually wanting the city to be more active in that area. Uh, and they certainly are wanting us to act in a more timely fashion than sometimes we're able to given the rest of our workload. And what it really means for us when we just have just a two staff person division is that we have no room for backup uh, if we have vacations or extended illnesses. Now, uh, this one did not make it through the first part of the, of the budget process, uh, but I think one of the things that you've been hearing from folks is, is these were the things that we started with. So this one started with, but it's not part of any of your options because um, it's, it's already on the cutting room floor, so to speak. Uh, the next piece though, code enforcement officer, part-time, you've you heard some conversation about that last week. Uh, and as I've already mentioned, the citizen complaints are increasing and they certainly want uh, faster response times from the city. The way we handle that right now, complaint only basis, um, and we work that in around our other, our other items, our plan reviews, our inspections, uh, our sign permits, all of those kinds of things. We, we work the code enforcement around the edges. Sometimes it becomes the, the main chunk of a week or two and then it sort of slides off to the side just a little bit. So we've got quite a bit going on already uh, and there are some new burdens which are headed our way or already are headed our way. One deals with right of way vegetation. I think you've probably either heard public works or legal or both talk about our needs to be more proactive in keeping vegetation trimmed back out of the right of way. Some pretty prominent case law said now the city can't really sit back and wait on that anymore. We have to, if we see it, we've got to take action on it. Um, and so there's some code enforcement aspect with that. Uh, and then the other one, the zombie houses, uh, legislation that now makes it possible for the lending institutions to ask the cities or counties uh, to to do some of their legwork for them. My words, not the law's words, but that's essentially what it is. Uh, and we have to do that. We have to respond uh, in a timely fashion. We have to provide them the information that they're looking for. And this is information which is necessary for them in order to start to clear these uh, zombie properties off of their books uh, and get them back out there for sale. And if uh, Mrs. Sparza was here, she'd be nodding her head up and down telling you that this is absolutely something we have to do. The first requests we got that came through were like, what, what is this? We're, we're, we're being the, the investigative arm, if you will, for these uh, lending institutions. Nikki checked into it and yes, we, we have an obligation to do this. So we expect that to increase. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that, that we really want to have the code enforcement position. Lastly, um, the position that we are trying to, to bring into development services actually currently resides in public works and will be ceasing its role out there at the end of this calendar year. Uh, and so it's, it's, the same, it's, a, it's the same position, if you will. The focus will change. Uh, we're, we're going to use the same staff person, uh, but obviously the funding is different because when it was out of public works, it was in the utility funds, and when it's over here, it would be in the general fund. Uh, so code enforcement officer part-time is super important to us, particularly because it will help us at least take some of that load off of my plans examiner and my building official. Um, and if we're, not able to, if we're not able to have the building inspector, then this is a big help for us. Lastly, uh, development review engineer. So council's probably aware that right now we're relying on outside review through a consultant contract. That's the vast majority um, of the uh, development review right now. Now our staff in engineering out of public work still has some projects that they were initially involved in that they're seeing out. And occasionally we have to assign them uh, a new one as well. But most of that is going to John Semero uh, through the consultant contract that the city has with him. And so working with Kathy Rosen um, and administration, what we came up with was the idea of transferring one of the vacant engineer positions that is out in public works into development services. 
uh, and creating the development review engineer um, downstairs. And what that would actually do is, is sort of take us back to where we were pre-2009 when we had what was usually referred to as a one-stop shop downstairs where we had planning, building, and engineering all in one location. Uh, there were some good logistical and, and operational reasons why we, we changed that in 2009, but this might be the time for us to re-examine that one-stop shop kind of thought process. So what do we get out of that when we do that? Well, first of all, it's more convenient for the public because when they come with their development-related questions, they can see a planner, a building staff person, and an engineer all in the same location. And so it promotes uh, customer service. Certainly promotes efficiency for them as well as for us. Uh, there are some things that, as you probably know, you just do better when your work group is together. And, and looking at complex development projects is, is one of those things. Uh, and we actually believe that this will help decrease some of our permitting time uh, because if the position is over here, it will be focused on development review um, and won't have other uh, projects that would necessarily be assigned to it that are public works engineering related. Now, if necessary, we will certainly would, will help out. Uh, but first and foremost, this person would be providing uh, development review services. Uh, and really, so then what they would do is they would provide development or project review, but also drop-in service. So if we've got a question, somebody has a question about their, their grinder pump, or somebody has a question about stormwater and those kinds of things, they'd be able to at least get some initial answers to those questions um, from the staff person downstairs. So uh, I think this is really uh, a very significant thing for the city to try to accomplish. Hopefully the, the council will agree. Uh, and see your, your, see your way fit to funding that. That's yes. it for me. Councilor Flaxman. Yeah, I, just, um, I would say that I agree in having um, your engineering specific to development. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the new position of the economic development PR type person that we'd all like to have on staff, but I think that um, I think that this is just as or more important. I think that before we could get anywhere with, with bringing on a, a, a new employee like that, we have to be more efficient in with people that come wanting development, wanting to, to build something, to do something, uh, improve something. I think that this is maybe a good step towards that. Um, like I said, just as or maybe even more important than adding a, a separate staff member, we've got to get our own, anything that we can do to make it more efficient and timely um, is a positive to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Councilor Heisen. Thank you. I want to make sure I have this right. Uh, you mentioned in the three requested positions that the building inspector position was on the cutting room floor. Yes. Can I get that right? Okay, yeah. so um, so that's no longer on the table in terms of the proposed... It's not one of the six options that I think that the council was presented at your okay. at your workshop last... It was in the options. Oh, I'm sorry. Option one? Oh, yes, the, 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 the whole big option, yes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, <laughs> I stand corrected. Thank Where's you, Patricia. Um, and then the code enforcement officer would be transferring from public works to you. Right. Theoretically. And so the only brand new, created from scratch, extra hire would be the development review engineer? Yes, but it's a vacant position that's out at Public Works. And so what, what Mrs. Rosen has, has offered is the ability to transfer one of her two vacancies out there. Okay. Over here, so the, so the, in total, there wouldn't be an increase in FTEs, okay. um, but that that position would be repurposed, sure. for lack of a better phrase. Okay. Yeah. And question on the the building inspector. That certainly seems to be a key part of the the operation over there. Would it be? I, I don't know what that all entails or what kind of qualifications or certifications a building inspector would need, but it would it be possible to have the code enforcement officer back up the existing building inspectors? Is that a thing or are those two totally different wheelhouses? They would be totally two totally different wheelhouses unless you had that rare individual who also had those certifications. 
Uh, and so what we do right now is obvious is our plans examiner that position description also includes building inspection services and he has all of the necessary certifications and then of course obviously our our building official has all of those certifications as well so between the two of them they do plan review and they do building inspections it just depends on which one of them is out doing it on any given day okay. anyone else any other questions? Yes, please. Yeah, just in ranking as priorities, because limited resources, we just kind of have to look at things in priority. From my point of view, um, probably the most important to try to fill is the code enforcement officer part-time. Uh, like he mentioned, uh, that would help some of the issues with the increased volume. Uh, next priority probably is the development review uh, engineer. And then probably the, the least is the building inspector, but certainly I think all these positions have merit, but when we're starting to look at the big picture here and, and trying to, uh, to prioritize, I would probably put it in that order. Yes, Councilor Cervides. So are they, is it fairly budget neutral then overall, these changes obviously going from utilities to general funds, or is it not budget neutral to general funds? These are coming out of utilities, even though we have the same organizational FTEs. I'm trying to get my head around is how much money are we moving around from utilities over the general fund if we were to bring all which I think is very important, the review engineer. It's about 32,000, 32 to 35,000 to general fund in addition. Um, because when it's sitting in public um, works, they split it amongst the utilities, and there's a, a reduction. In um, that comes from development services that wouldn't, and it's around twenty some thousand. So it's it's increased um, about thirty thousand. I remember that on the options you had. Yeah. Now that I'm having that and then okay. the code enforcement, same thing. It's about twenty some thousand dollars to bring it over to general. Fund. So right now, it's that position's working for a utility thing. So code enforcement, so it's being charged there. Yeah. It would be transferring to the general fund, so the charges need to go there. I think I support, I think what we all said, you probably summed up, Mr. Edmund, how I would feel as far as review engineer, code enforcement officer, and as far as prioritizing. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Next, I think we have our harbor master approaching. Thank you for the graphical presentation. <laughs> Chris Sublet, harbor master, welcome. Hey everybody, I'm here today to talk to you about the marina budget for the next two years, 2019 and 2020. Oops. Just a little history on the marina. The marina was actually built in 1974. It was a brainchild of Al Cucci and Roger Leonardi, who was our first harbor master. That's the sign that, that they put up at the current marina site. We still have that sign. It's kind of neat. Our marina is about 423 slips. We have all different shapes and sizes, covered and uncovered. We have a bunch of storage sheds. We have dry boat storage, and we cover about six acres. One of the neat things about the marina is we are an enterprise fund. That means that we're self-supported. Some of the real revenue workhorses for us are, are the moorage, the sheds, and the fuel. We do not receive any, any taxpayer funds. And we're not part of the general fund either, so we're solely supported. So the trends at the marina, what's happening at the marina? Well, the revenue from the period of January through October, that's, that's the most current information I have. In July, or excuse me, in 2017 and 2018, we're seeing about a 12.3% increase over the past year, which is pretty good. In our occupancy in the same time frame, we're only seeing a 4.4% increase, but it's interesting to note in the last five years, or five years ago in 2013, our average occupancy per month was only 71.2. So we're really trending up in, in both re revenue and occupancy. The marina rates. The Marine Advisory Committee is actually reviewing the rates for 2019 and they're discussing a possible 3 to 5% rate increase. This would be across the board in all categories, things such as mooring, 
moorage, storage sheds, services, everything that we do. And in that range, if they do go between the 3 to 5 percent rate increase, it may generate an additional 53,000 to 88,000. Also in 2020, they're likely to review the rates again. So how do we get to the marina budget? What's our process? We compared the budgeted amount for this year to the year-to-date totals. We determined if those current budgeted amounts were accurate and in the um, right area. And we found that some of them needed to be increased while others had to be decreased. And then we gave a 3% increase to both revenue and the expenses. In the budget this year, we have the capital improvement request. And we're also requesting one more person at the marina, a new hire. Other than that, we don't have any other major requests. So in 2019, we're requesting one marina maintenance level one. That would be a regular full-time employee. The cost of that is approximately $70,000, which includes the benefits. The real reason we need this person is, is to main the level, maintain the level of customer service that, that we have down there. You've seen where the occupancy is going up, but the staff is staying the same. We also have a higher level of maintenance that's needed. Our marina was built in 1974, so it's now 44 years old. And we really try to do all of the maintenance in-house that we can because that saves a lot of money. Some of the big projects we're looking at are, are replacing whalers, putting in electric pedestals, and doing some cement work on the docks. Those, those are just a few of the major projects. The marina historically had five full-time employees. We currently only have four. We've talked about this for the last three or four years, but just decided to be very conservative in our hiring and try and put some money into reserves. What's interesting is we wanted to know if our staffing was comparable to marinas in the area. So we looked at the marinas and, and we figured the best way to do it would be to figure out the ratio to, of slips to employees. All of us have slips and that's the one common thing that all the marinas have. You can see where Cap Sante has 70 slips, 73 slips per employee. LeConnor has 61, Everett has 59, Des Moines has 75, and we're at 106. So it doesn't match up with what the other marinas are doing. So based upon that rationale there, we're, we're grossly understaffed. You can see that our office staff is one and a half people and our maintenance staff is two and a half people currently. That's because I bounce between the two wherever, wherever I'm needed. Be happy to answer any questions. Councilor Cervades. Mayor, the revenue increase, just intrigued, where is that predominantly from? Fuel, moorage? It's mostly moorage. Moorage is a real workhouse of the marina and we are full and we've got a lot bigger boats in the marina which generate more revenue. So the occupancy permit then is that, when you say mortgage, that's probably a guess then? Because the occupancy only went up by 4 percent or something? Yeah, the, no, I would say that it's from permanent mortgage because we're getting bigger boats in. So the bigger boats you get in, they generate more mortgage. So for example, the 50, 60, and 70 footers that we now have in, we weren't getting years ago. They still count as a tick in the occupancy, but they, they cast a bigger shadow in the revenue category. Okay. And then I just didn't see our local brethren as far as Skyline or Anacortes Marina as far as a slip comparison, any reason we didn't use them? No, I just chose the ones that we're using currently in our um, rate survey for the marinas. All right, thank you. Sure. City Administrator. My uh, observation here and, and uh, adjusting from freshwater harbor to a saltwater sure. harbor has different things and so I appreciate you. Uh, and looking at the history there, I think certainly I, I support the new position. Um, and uh, my, my challenge is, is if we're going to add that position, we really want the revenue to correlate and be able to fund it. And some of the challenges is, is we instead of we already set the budget and then you look at the rate increases in in April and May when we've already got the budget. And my kind of issue with that is. I would like to see the rates and making sure that we have the rate increases to support that position before authorizing that mm -hmm. position. And that's the challenge with the way we set the budget first and then do the rates afterwards that I have and kind of the, the uh, hesitation I have in, in going ahead and just 
proving that, that uh, new position. Certainly, I think it's needed. Uh, just, I certainly, but I'm just uh, want to make sure that we have the revenue to support it. Mayor Brooke. Um In the past, I have sent some pictures to staff members. We're always in the same boat as Des Moines on services up because we're the only two city marinas. Well, a uh, year and a half, two years ago, they charged for parking. Mm -hmm. They have a daytime parking and all the residents have a permanent parking pass. They also charge for using the lift. It seems to be, um, you know, the ticket little gates doesn't seem to be that much problem, but some infrastructure to add. But I keep hearing from not you, but some staff members, well, we can't because we have to give the money all back to DNR. Well, how are they doing it? You know, sometimes the burden is only put on the people who have boats there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it seems unfair when you see, in a sense, people from Tacoma and stuff coming up here, they're parking, they're going down, they're smelting all day, they go back home, they come the next day. And so we are part of our park system and yet we receive no funds from parks. So I'm just, I wanna be sure that we're being fair, but right now everything is on the backs of the people who have slips there. And if other marinas can do things, how come we can't to help ourselves? Um, it, it, you know, they still seem to have plenty of people who wanna park there, whether they're charging for them to park there for the day or overnight or whatever uh, i just can we investigate that maybe it's time to reopen that so that it doesn't look like we're unfairly only we are an enterprise fund that's how we're set up but it just seems like it's only on the backs of the voters and um i just want to be sure that we've looked at all options and that we're fair yeah. especially when you see the commercial guys come in with all their trucks and all their stuff and we don't get a dime from that. I'm sorry, that seems wrong. They're getting away with some fees because they're not putting in someplace else. And then I have also seen their crab traps parked on our docks and they're not there. So I just would like it to be with that. One of the things that we're doing with the Marine Advisory Committee is we're tackling the rate discussion first. Okay. And then once we finish this, we are gonna have a conversation with them regarding the ramp and parking and those sorts of things. Everything starts with the Marine Advisory Committee though. Okay, if you need those pictures, I resend, I'll resend yeah. them, I slap them on my phone. So when you're also talking about parking, it's kind of in, it's, it's a type of launch fee too. So right now we don't do a launch fee and I know it's a custom in other areas I've been at to have a launch fee, even a voluntary one, to bring in some revenue on that. But it was interesting to me that we don't do that here. Even counties charge for people back in and about and watching it. Yeah. Thank you. Councilor Cervantes. Thank you. I want to circle back to our city administrator's comment. I didn't give this a lot of thought because I thought, well, it's a it's an enterprise fund, so that you guys can justify the position. But are you are is the budget as it's being presented operating under the assumption that those rates will pass to then fund that position? I guess that wasn't clear to me. We're not putting the new, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're not looking at the new revenues. We don't have any idea on it. I think you put out a nice number of the goal, three to 5% increases, but it's gotta go through two or three meetings of the, uh, of the, uh, yes. Yeah, two or, three me two or three meetings of the Marine Advisory Committee, and then it, and it goes to council sometime in April probably. Mm -hmm. So on the rates, we didn't do an increase on the rates um, other than Chris looked at what his growth was based on his current rates, and we didn't address the rates, but we adjusted the growth based on the usage. And right now, we can, we can support our current rates and our, our current revenue supports adding a new person Excellent. without any increases. That's the part of the clarification. Thank you. Um, so but it has to give somewhere, so it maybe just would be less in your reserves or, you know, that you're gonna, if, we, if you didn't increase rates of things, mm -hmm. stay the same, it may. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It does have to come from somewhere. So if nothing changed, if everything remained the same, so that would be less money going into the reserves, then. correct? If I could, just one last thought on that. So, um, 
last budget cycle, we actually gave some thought to as to whether or not we could support it at that time. And it looked like the numbers would probably support it, but we were wanting to be super conservative and make sure that we weren't seeing just a momentary. We want to make sure we really were on the, on the upswing. Um, but we could have made it work last time, um, but Chris and his staff figured out how to make do for the other two years. Uh, and so now, now we're really comfortable in saying mm -hmm. that we believe that we can support this um, under the current revenue as we understand it. And so the title of that person that you said was maintenance specialist? Right. So we have enough in reserves to do maintenance to keep them busy? We do. We do. That goes back into the way we do things. Um, we do a lot of things in-house that marinas typically uh, contract out to do. For example, we build our own whalers, we rebuild our own power pedestals, we do our own cement work. We're, we're fortunate in the sense that the people that work there are really handy and really creative and, and they love a challenge and they'll always go out and give their best and try and fix something before we hire somebody. Mm -hmm. Okay. No other questions? Thank you, Chris. And we will invite our fire chief to come to the table. Thanks, chief Mayor. Wow, I got two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy is still there? No, Jim. He was just for the, the big part. Okay. Darn. I would have brought my long presentation if I knew I had this much time. So. You and I didn't bring the candy this time. You don't have to use the two hours. Of yeah. two hours. I don't have to use it? No. no. Okay, so, you, so all right. So, uh, and, and I'm going to say this disclaimer right off the bat. These are proposed numbers. This is draft budget. This is not finalized. Numbers will change. Numbers will change. Did I cover all the bases? Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> I had that drummed into me this morning and yesterday and last yeah, week. And on your credits, yes. Yes. So just as an overview, just as, as a little bit of review, of course, there's myself, the deputy chief. We've got four captains in the department, uh, one lieutenant, four, fire, four career firefighters, an administrative assistant, and we've got 32 paid on call. Uh, that makes up the entire bulk of our organization. Uh, when you look at what we do, it's amazing how we do with what we do with the people that we have. We did request a new lieutenant for 2019. That was denied, and we requested two firefighters for, four, or for 20, and that was denied as well. Give you an idea of some demographics, uh, and I've brought this up before. We cover 9.7 square miles, population base of about 23,000 people. Uh, in 17, we went on 1,362 calls, which is a 23% increase in responses from 2012. Uh, so our call numbers continue to go up uh, about 3 to 4% every year. Uh, these are the funds we've looked at from 2014 up through 2020. Uh, and again, 19 and 20 are proposed numbers. Uh, the majority of that, of course, is uh, personnel. Uh, as you've heard before, it, it's expensive to have people. Uh, when you consider revenue sources, the fire department doesn't bring in a lot of money. Uh, we bring in probably about 40 to $46,000 a year on revenue streams. Uh, the biggest one being the hospital contract that we renew every two years with Whidbey General. Uh, and then our permit fees. Uh, you do see a little bit of decline in 2020, and I'll explain that here in just a little bit. Uh, one of the things we had to increase was in the uh, 17 and 18 budget, the training pay for our paid on call firefighters was removed. Uh, you've been, we've talked about that before. It's back into the budget in 19 and 20, and that's about a $30,000 a year expenditure. Uh, I've got to replace some old fire suppression equipment. We've got stuff that's 25 and 30 years old that is just flat worn out. The parts are no longer supported for it. Uh, we've made it work, but it's time to replace it. Uh, so there are some items in there that we have to purchase. Uh, we've got to replace some bunker gear in both of the years. Uh, we have a life expectancy of 10 years. At the end of the 10th year, uh, by NFPA standards, we have to get rid of that bunker gear and destroy it. Uh, and when you talk bunker gear at $2,500 a set, uh, it adds up rather quickly. Uh, in 19, I know I've got to buy at least 8 sets, and in 20, I need to buy at least 10 sets. They expire, we've got to replace them. Uh, we do have an expense in travel expenses, and, and a small one, but an important one, is the increase in the ICOM fees. Uh, we pay ICOM for dispatching services based on the previous three years of usage. Uh, this year, in, in 19, our rates for dispatch went up 11%. Uh, 
PDs went up only about 1%. So it, it's based on the number of calls that we have and there's a whole long formula. Uh, but we did see a, a sizable increase in the ICOM fees. Uh, two years ago, we only saw a 1% increase in dispatching fees. Uh, so th there's you know, cause and effect to everything. Uh, when we take a look at this, all of the wages and benefits are put in by the finance department. Something that's going to affect us, though, is Initiative 1433 that raised the minimum wages. Uh, in 19, it goes up another 50 cents an hour, and in 2020, it goes up $1.50 an hour. Uh, so that's going to play a role in our paid on call folks as far as the minimum wage goes. And then uh, Sandra takes care of all the Interfund motor pool stuff. She takes care of all the vehicle equipment and Interfund transfers, and she also provides the information for the tech funds, both the hardware and the software. Uh, and she comes up with all that funding for us. When we take a look at the motor pool, uh, we take care of four engines, a ladder truck, a rescue, two of our SUVs, a pickup, a tractor trailer, and some of our specialty vehicles. And it all costs money to maintain those. Uh, you know, and, and I, one thing to bring up is the ladder truck. Uh, as I brought this up before, it's now 27 years old. It's considered obsolete. Uh, if we have to get a part for it, sometimes it has to be manufactured. Uh, we had a uh, hydraulic block that failed. Uh, we've, waited, we've waited 12 weeks to get the block. Uh, and where it used to be relatively inexpensive, it's now $1,400. Because everything now for that ladder truck has to be uh, engineered and rebuilt. So that ladder truck does cost us some money to maintain. We do set money aside every year for vehicles, for pagers, for self-contained breathing apparatus, for hose, the station generator, and the portable radios. Our SCBAs are going to be due for expiring in 2020. Uh, they have a 15-year life expectancy. We put money aside for them. We're going to have to replace 32 mac or packs, 75 bottles, uh, 45 masks at about $270,000. Uh, we do have money set aside in 2020 for that. Uh, we are going to go for a FEMA grant, uh, a region-wide FEMA grant for us, North Whidbey, Central, and South Whidbey. Camino went for one this year and they got $950,000. Uh, we have acquired their paperwork and we're going to put Oak Harbor Region, Whidbey Island in their names and resubmit it and see if we can't get the same amount of money uh, and do a regional grant and, and see if we can be successful in getting that grant for our SCBAs. Uh, but that's going to come up in, in 2020. Uh, we do set side money aside for computers and hardware, annual fees. Uh, like the other groups to tell you, we're, you know, we're as self-sufficient as everyone else we try to be. We do all of our own janitorial work. We do all of our own landscaping and lawn maintenance. Uh, we try to do as much building maintenance as possible in order to keep the cost down. Uh, this is a big one, ladder hose and pump testing. We save probably about thirty-five dollars to $40,000 a year by doing these tests ourselves, where we test all of our own grand ladders, we test all of our own hose, we test all of our own pumps. Uh, we have over two miles of hose that we test every year. Uh, so by doing it in-house, it, it can, you know, brings the, the price down considerably. And you know, our intent is to be as cost efficient as we possibly can. Uh, we know that we're a drain on the, the general uh, fund. Uh, we've talked about the capital purchases already, our HVAC system, uh, vehicle exhaust system and the West Side Station. Uh, so you know these are coming up. Uh, again, that HVAC system is 27 years old and we're going to start replacing them uh, two units per year over the next few years. Uh, we've talked about the vehicle exhaust system already. Uh, Patricia and her group were able to find $100,000 in REIT funds. Uh, so that's going to make a big difference on getting that system put into the, the apparatus bay. Uh, and as we all know, the new station's on hold for now. Uh, and then emergency services budget. Uh, again, this is proposed. These are not solid numbers. They could change between now and the 20th. Yes, they could. So I just wanted to put that disclaimer up there. Uh, and you can see how, how our numbers have gone up. Uh, realize that uh, in the fire side, I'm a 9 tenths FTE. My other tenth comes out of emergency services being the director of emergency management. Uh, so that's why you see the numbers the way they are. Uh, otherwise, uh, that fund is relatively small as far as operating expenses go. The biggest cost in here is uh, my salary and benefits. That's all I got. I try to keep it really short and very concise. You thought I was going to talk for two hours. Mm -hmm.
Questions? Mayor Broken. Thank you. Um, do you have anyone in your department that has written grants before? Angela. Okay. Because I'm going to say Sandra Place, I'm sure she wouldn't mind looking over, but. Yes. If you briefly just said we'll take their form and whatever, I, I think you need to be sure someone oh, goes we over will. it to be sure oh, that yeah, yeah. your numbers are. Thank you. My, my point was good luck. they were very good on getting theirs, yes. and the gentleman that wrote it is absolutely finite in writing grants. He's gotten five or six for Camino Island. So. so. Good, good. Excellent. Answer of Good. Yes, I am. Um, curious, I, I like numbers, obviously, in the trends they represent uh, the call response going up does that correlate in any way to population so from 2012 has the population grown yes similarly yes and then the icon you said it was 11 yeah. percent over last year over three years it's three years three years and is that uh, what what that trend is just indicative more people call for maybe aid or things they wouldn't normally have called on or just more incidents oh uh, Good question. When we look at calls, any call that goes into ICOM for our services, whether it be a service call or an actual emergency, it constitute a call. So anytime they push our pager, that's a call. Even when they call for uh, the duty chief to call ICOM, that constitutes a page that constitute a call. Uh, so people calling in for lift assist, uh, a water problem. Uh, when we see those kinds of increases, uh, last year we had a lot of service calls for lift assists and of course that brings the trend up and that brings that call number up from ICOM substantially or exponentially actually so that's where we get the the increase in, in in call volume and I should know this but if we roll out if we get a call for basic aid do we send all four Firefighters to keep them together. Is there any way to just roll out the aid truck with two folks, or you don't know until you get there, and then you can call for more? How does that normally work? Yes and no. Okay. So let me give you the yes side, give you the no side. We've got an hour and a half. We got an hour and a half, so I'm good. <laughs> um, if our guys are already out on a, out doing something, and a call comes in, they'll just take the engine and go. Okay. If it's a known CPR, somebody's unconscious, unresponsive, we'll take the engine, so we have a four-person crew at the incident. Uh, if we've got let's say we've got our four-person crew on and either Mike or Craig are in the building and a medical call comes in we'll just take the rescue uh, so there's some parameters on which apparatus we'll take and then the amount of staffing that we have will also determine which rig we take uh, if I've only got a three-person crew on uh, and a medical call comes in we're gonna take the engine because it does us no good to leave one person stand at the station by themselves right. uh, whereas I could take that engine the, the downfall of that is it's more expensive to operate that engine uh, but you know, I, I go to a medical call with an engine, and if I get a fire, I can respond directly to the fire. If I've only got one person back at the station and a fire comes in, we're gonna wait five to eight minutes to get our right. volunteers in to respond out. Right. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Right. Difficult to win. All right, thank you. Anyone else? That's it? <laughs> Why, wow, that's easy. So could you email that? I certainly myself, will. Myself, at least, and then you bet. same with Marina. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, Chief. Hello. So, Thursday from 1 to 4, we're going to have Public Works do their um, budgets, which as we know, that is the bulk of the utilities and um, the inter interfund programs. And then on the 20th, I'll be bringing the final draft to you guys. Um, it will actually probably be delivered right before the meeting. And then you'll have two weeks to review it before we'll ask for a um, vote on an ordinance on December 4th. We're also going to come back on the 28th, um, and I'll, I have that on our um, workshop agenda, so if you think of questions that you would like to ask in the workshop setting or changes that you would like to see, we still have time to make changes after the 20th. So do you have any questions for me? Any questions? Just get clarity, so 
Um, the police department, we discussed that a lot already with the jail issue, so that's right, the reason why we didn't elect to do that. Admin, uh, we've been talking about the economic development and the uh, community, or the uh, PIO communication position separately, so we didn't feel that was warranted, and there's really no major changes with HR, legal, and finance, and so that's the reason why we didn't cover those departments um, in this two-day workshop. But certainly public works is a big area, a lot of things on that, so uh, we're making that a whole day, <laughs> yep. a whole uh, afternoon uh, discussion on Thursday for that department. And Kathy plans to keep it at a high level of changes and things that are going on, just so you guys are aware the whole goal for how she set her budget. That's what she told me. Councilor Sebade. Question, just two things I think to clarify there. Tell me when we'll see these. You mentioned, Mr. O'Gorman, the police budget, and I had a conversation with Chief Trusker. So the current budget as we see it is kind of, assuming nothing's really changing with the jail. That right. If that changes, though, hopefully it's kind of a net neutral we're hoping for net neutral, but what um, the chief and I had talked about is until everything's decided, um, things are signed, people are hired from the jail or not hired from the jail or however that ends up working out, we really don't know what to budget. I don't want to preemptively assume things without having final numbers. So what we're hoping is once that's done, we can take a final look at it and come to you with a budget adjustment if necessary or a budget confirmation of where we're at in the budget. Okay. Yeah, but but it appears to be fairly close to at this budget, point, but very yeah. close to budget neutral. Yeah, unless so when we were trying to make a decision, I think my first assertion was let's put it in there. Yeah. But then it's really dependent upon the county. Mm -hmm. um, the key area there is the 21st, I believe, is when the county is going to approve the uh, agreement, and I think the 20th is when the council's up, uh, going to do the service agreement with the count with that. So until city does that contract and until the county approves the inner service agreement for the jail services it's hard for us to really go ahead and budget for it um, so yeah and i and when he did his presentation i was talking about i thought we'd put it in there but when we did further review it didn't make sense to to go ahead and put that in there until it's a done deal yeah i wouldn't want to under budget or over budget i'd like to just get it as close as we can for you and then you may have said this but i'm just trying to get my own mind street economic development personnel person and or public affairs person when will we possibly see those options um for sure on the 20th but okay. i'm if we want um once the decision's been finalized by the mayor and blaine of the options um i can send an email or they can send an email I just don't want to send something out until the mayor and Blaine have had a chance to make sure they um, tell me exactly what they'd like me to do. Whatever is most effective, just to give us a heads up. Sometimes it's helpful to have sure. that some insight there before we dive into budget. So if we yep. are thinking of other options or have concerns, we just get a little bit of a, a heads up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you can see by the options we presented on the 17th. Funding those full, full funding those two positions very difficult in the budget. So we're looking at some hybrid, downscaled options um, to make the numbers work and try to meet the need. The goal is that we heard heard you loud and clear, um, and so I think the mayor and Blaine are coming up with ideas that will actually meet the need for council. I think we still intend to show some options you know just want to look at okay. those numbers yeah i think that's the plan so it's hard i can show options but if i'm presenting a final budget on the 20th i'm yeah I no I probably have to communicate back and forth before right. then before yeah. then i mean yeah. we'll we'll have a final budget but i mean she she shows the options on the 7th we'll show some options and i think we're going to be very transparent on what we cut absolutely. out absolutely yeah mayor broken so I'm gathering that when the county was meeting to do their draft, they're agreeing to the option of expanding their jail and doing a contract. Okay, just wanted to be sure that was still on track and that rug has not been pulled out. No. Okay. No, they're still just, on track with, okay. with uh, I believe, on the 21st at their meeting um, okay. and on, us on the 20th for the inner service agreement. To provide jail services and so uh, and then closing our jail was 
is dependent upon that agreement. Thank you. Okay, uh, seeing no other business, I assume there's no other business at this time, we will adjourn. And I think some people are going to Anna Portis, so mm -hmm. for another meeting. Thank you. Thank you.